everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today for episode eight of season six of the Revise and Resubmit podcast. I'm Dr. Kim Bissell, the Southern Progress Endowed Professor in Magazine Journalism and the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Communication and Information Sciences at the University of Alabama. And I'm Dr. Annalisa Boland, an Assistant Professor in the Department of Communication Studies, also at the University of Alabama, and we both work in the Institute for Communication and Information Research, or the ICIR, at UA. As our wonderful listeners know, we launched a series back in the fall called What's New With? And the goal of this series was to catch up with guests we had previously chatted with at least two years ago. And today, just like last week, we're doing just that. But before we give you all those details, we're going to dive into our regular gotta have a question (laughs) in the intro. Okay, so I'm going to start us off with questioning today. And there are lots of possibilities out there. Uh, But here we go. In the spirit of what's new with in the past two years, Kim, have you changed any of your virtual assistants or your virtual assistants routine? Do you have the same ones, new ones? Did you change any of their voices? Okay, that's a great question. And I think, let me start with the very last question. I do change voices. Um, Sometimes I'm in feeling inspired by places that I want to go like Australia or (laughs) England and I will change the voice for sure for that um I think uh, so let me back this up I think I tend to find myself getting rather frustrated and grumpy when I'm using a virtual assistant but that's largely because I may have a very specific question or I want information that doesn't necessarily align mm. with the ready-made prompts. Even with the, the, the Google ones from maps, mm-hmm. sometimes it's unclear and that gets me kind of grumpy because sometimes I just want to speak with a human. Mm-hmm. But if I am speaking to a virtual assistant, I don't mind the British ones or <laughs> ones um so i do have to admit i think it depends on the company and the service that i'm needing at that moment um so airline help not my favorite mm-hmm. but if i have a general question uh, it may be useful it may free me up from spending time on the phone or on a website so i have to ask and i'm i'm so excited about this answer and i don't even know what it is <laughs> do you use them um or do you know what what do you what do you think about your virtual assistants? Okay, so while this virtual assistant is not new, and well, actually, I, so I thought I had such a great answer, and I'm not even sure this is a virtual assistant. Um, <laughs> but in super fun assistant news, even if it's not virtual, I turned on my Roomba the other month for like the first time in at least five years, and it worked, and, it, and it was amazing. And okay, so I don't is that a it's an assistant. Is it vert? I don't know if it's virtual. I guess it's not virtual. Okay. So fail on that answer. Um, but it is an assistant. It is an assistant. So <laughs> I think that in the past two years, I have had maybe fewer virtual assistants. And maybe that's because of the conversation that we had with this guest today over two years ago yes and so I am like always assuming that someone is listening to the point of like (laughs) sometimes I even whisper in my own house (laughs) so okay so when we last caught up with today's guest she told us all about her research and voice assistance and digital assistance but since that time she spent additional time studying how virtual assistants could be tailored toward a very specific market Um, like an elderly population or examining how virtual assistants can be designed to provide more empathetic responses. Like, Hey Kim, you seem a little stressed. I would love that. I would love that (laughs) virtual assistant who could detect stress in my voice. Imagine that. We cover so much ground in today's conversation and today's topic is just fascinating given how much virtual assistants and digital assistants have become so much more popular and common in the two years since we last had our guest on the podcast. So without further delay, please join us in welcoming Dr. Miriam Sweeney, an associate professor in library and information studies, back to the podcast. Mary, 
fam, thank you so much for joining us in our What's New With series. We cannot wait to hear about all that you've been doing in the last two years since we talked to you. Yeah, it's really great to be back, and I almost can't believe it's been two years. That is really kind of like a weird missing time segment. It both was really slow and went really fast, right? That's right. Uh, Absolutely. Okay, so we're going to kick off with a couple of questions that are easy um, and don't require too much thinking. And one of those is, remind us where you are originally from. Oh, sure. I'm originally from Bloomington, Indiana. So go Hoosiers. Um, I've actually noticed that there's a lot of like Indiana connections within our college, um, whether folks went to school at Indiana University, Mm -hmm. which also I did. Um, (laughs) But like, it's intriguing. It's like you can really like map that out. There's a lot of us here. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. And then what is your title now? My title now is Associate Professor in Library and Information Studies. Perfect. Okay, so here's a very fun question, or at least we have a lot of fun with it. Um, what did the young Miriam want to be when she grew up? Did you always kind of envision yourself oh. being a professor as eight-year-old Miriam, or did you see a different future? I love that question. So um, young Miriam wanted to be... Uh, an anthropologist, and that's actually what I did my undergrad degree in. Um, I loved like social sciences, and I was, you know, a science Olympiad nerd kid, um, but very interested in like people and culture and, you know, um, and wanted to travel and things like that. So I definitely, so I went to school for that too, and archaeology was kind of my specialty. But it's funny because in the background there, um, when I was 14, my mom said, you know, uh, why don't you go get a job, you know, be useful. And uh, be I useful. said, okay, cool. I'll go work at the public library. Uh, and I started working at the public library as a page. I ended up working there all through high school and all through college. And then also after college, I was working in libraries and museums. So it's like, uh, I was always like, well, I'm not going to be a librarian, though. Like, that's crazy, right? Mm-hmm. Um but it was there all along. So at some point, um, I kind of like got with like the universe telling me that maybe I was, you know, kind of doing a thing (laughs) already (laughs) that I was passionate about, right? And, you know, there was still like a lot of interest from, you know, there's a lot of crossover. I mean, I I also worked in high school or in college for um, like museums, doing museum programming. And so like the anthropology stuff kind of crossed over with the library stuff. And there's a lot of, you know, whatever. But anyway, yes, anthropology, archaeology, that's what young Miriam thought she'd be doing. Turns out the uh, archaeology is a lot of washing rocks. And uh, <laughs> they don't tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's what that is. <laughs> it's, it's funny because I think like I, I went through a, a rock phase myself. Uh-huh. And I, I think it was a, I think it was very short lived, um, and maybe it was because there I saw something or read something on washing rocks, and I thought, Meh. yeah, maybe not. That's a real okay. thing. Yeah. But so <laughs> give us an elevator pitch um, statement on what your research looks like today. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think when I talked to you last, we talked about voice assistance and, yep. you know, sort of yep. gender and design and things. I'm still in that track, um, looking at personal assistance and, and digital assistance. But right now, I'm kind of focused specifically on voice assistance and thinking about issues of, um, you know, sort of surveillance both in the home and the city Ooh. as voice assistants become plugged in more and more to, you know, to your daily life. Um mm-hmm. So, you know, that for me, really, uh, the interest is around issues of data collection, data privacy, transparency, you know, thinking about what it means to be networked into, you know, kind of the smart city, networked into um, systems of governance, and the way the home fits into that, you know, via these kind of, you know, personal technologies that we use day to day. So very similar, but, you know, kind of venturing off into a little bit of a different direction. I've done a lot of the gender and design pieces, which is still part of the story, Mm -hmm. um, but I'm definitely asking some new questions and expanding out. Oh, okay. Okay, So uh, 
I mean, uh, maybe this is this may not be a good question, but on a scale with like <laughs> one to ten, are are you are you uh, cautious about about in, like would you hook hook into the a, a smart city network, <laughs> knowing what you know? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that like we all are kind of hooked into the network, right? Which makes these questions really interesting, whether or not we understand ourselves to be part of it or not. Mm. Increasingly, you know, our data is intertwined with these systems. So, um, you know, looking at things like voice interfaces um, is just like one opening to kind of understand that connectivity that we all have. Um, you know, I mean, I, people always ask me like, okay, well, do you use like Alexa and such? And I don't, um, but that doesn't mean I'm not connected, right? Mm. Um, in so many different ways. Um, and so, you know, voice is an interesting technology. I mean, I, I know we have other things happening with, um, you know, chat GPT mm. and, you know, natural language processing. Voice to me is really interesting because as like a, it's, it is a biometric, you know, um, uh, data point that mm -hmm. actually tells us like a lot of information. You can get a lot of information from uh, voice. And we often don't think about voice in the same way you might think about like, you know, fingerprints or um, mm -hmm. other kinds of biometric data or facial recognition, right? But voice is, um, is actually, you know, powerful and you can determine things about people's health, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, and facilities and things like that from voice. So I'm intrigued by that as kind of a concept and, yeah, and just, um, you know, how this is getting, how it, how it can work also as an accessible technology, but um, but also what are the cautions along with that as well that we need to consider. Okay, so quick question here, because I was yeah. thinking about this like a month or two ago. Is voice identifying? Mm -hmm. Is voice identifying? Like, yeah, so is, like, is that like a... a, a C could you promise if we were so if we were just Ooh. recording without uh -huh. video, just audio, can you can you say that that's anonymous data or? Oh, no? I see. Yeah, good question. Ooh, I'm not sure. I I mean, ooh, I'll have to really think about that. Um, voice. I don't know. I'm not sure if we have the capability to say that it is identifying in the same way that we could like say that the fingerprint is a unique identifier mm -hmm. in that way. But from voice recording, you can tell things like, you know, um, you can like diagnose a number of kind of like medical related issues uh, or, mm -hmm. or not diagnose, but they can point you towards diagnostics. So there are things you can do with voice. But I think that's a really interesting question. Like, look at you, data researchers, thinking about this. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, no, I, no, I like it. I, I mean, I don't know the definitive answer on that, but now I want to find out with you. So let's do it. Let's do it. Because I was thinking, yeah. like, I don't, I don't know if I have like a unique voice, but some mm -hmm. people do. Mm -hmm. But particularly, yeah. like when you said, "Oh, voice could lead to like mm -hmm. help stuff." I'm like, well, yeah. then. I don't want my voice. I don't want people <laughs> thinking that that my voice is not protected in the same way. Right. Right. Mm. No. Totally. Yeah. I mean, something I'm looking at is um, the way that voice assistants are um, actually kind of being marketed as assistive devices towards elderly or disabled folks. Um, and if there's you know some crossovers in that as we age, we might have you know uh, lose some functionality in different ways. Mm. Um, and so voice assistants are, you know, being, you know, kind of targeting this. There's a service from Amazon called Alexa Together that mm. is specifically aimed at like senior care management, you know, where you can like enroll your loved one, but, you know, I mean, they, they have to also consent to be enrolled. And uh, basically it kind of allows for family members to, um, you know, drop in on the speaker, make sure they're, they're okay. It's kind of like other like lifeline technologies, right, that mm -hmm. we've had in the past. Um, but it has kind of more um, more datafied aspects to it. But like, so that was interesting to me because, you know, you might wonder like, okay, so these are targeting seniors or elderly folks. Um, what does it mean if like voice patterns, you know, could be uh, used by third parties like, you know, insurance companies to say, oh, well, you know, this person is actually exhibiting signs of dementia, right, in their vocal mm -hmm. patterns. Um, what would that mean in terms of the autonomy of the individual or their access to 
uh, you know, insurance or healthcare or, or you know, yeah, autonomy, right? Mm-hmm. So those are some of the questions that I'm thinking about because, you know, as we're promoting those as accessible devices, um, you know, that like we need to consider the privacy dimensions as an accessibility part. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if we're thinking about like helping people be autonomous and have you know control over their own destinies in different ways. So it just raises some interesting questions about, um, again, you know, where does that data go? How do we, you know, create processes or regulatory processes that protect the people um, who that data is, you know, or, you know, who who are the most impacted by that? Mm-hmm. Okay, I have many, many follow ups. <laughs> but let me, let, me, let, me, <laughs> okay. let me start with one. Um, you know, when you, this is just so fascinating to me. Because when you think about voice, um, I've had to be on the phone with banks and different people today. And I know that when you think about like tone and inflection and even accent, if you're just Mm. judging communication and, you know, (laughs) the words that are being said based on like the content, but also those other features what I'm wondering is like if you're if you're using a voice assistant for some health related matter and maybe Uh you're upset or maybe you're stressed or afraid or whatever it is is there something that detects that in the voice you know because maybe your voice is shaking or maybe the tone is softer or or something else is that something that voice assistants can pick up on and then also like respond to it Mm, yeah right great question so i think that like the thing about voice assistants is you know the things that you mentioned depend on the individual and their own patterns and so what's interesting about voice assistants is that they're actually in a position to capture like a really large corpus of data over time um so that for an individual you could see over time like how does that vocal pattern fit into you know other patterns so i mean it's the sort of the predictive analytic part of it mm-hmm. um, because if you just captured like a little uh sliver of conversation from a random person you would know how that fits into their overall you know patterns but what you're saying is you know okay so could this then you know could alexa be tracking me in ways that they would know that like, oh, in this moment, I'm stressed. So yes, in the sense that um, this is exactly the kind of the issue is that they they are capturing kind of a corpus of data that would allow them to say, okay, this person who I inter- you know, who is interacting and giving uh, voice data points all the time, now we can sort of see that like in this moment, there's like a deviation or whatever, like this, this mm-hmm. indicates heightened stress. Mm-hmm. So um, it's not necessarily that voice assistants at this point in time, um, like there is interest in the industry to develop voice assistants. So they are more, you know, engaged with kind of empathetic responses in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that's not currently happening with these products, right? With like Alexa, like Alexa's not currently like, Pam, you seem stressed, you know, do I need to suggest like <laughs> a candle from Amazon that you can buy and calm down with? Like maybe some self care. Here's a bubble bath. No, right? wait a minute. That would be amazing. That would that would be incredible. But I, think, but I think that like that is like that's an industry interest though. Is how do we kind of refine these to respond? You know, to um, to people in uh, in you know in more empathetic moments. But of course, you know, the example I just gave is. Like, is that something we want to sell us more products? Like, to to what end, right? There are other uses, of course, you know, in healthcare scenarios and things like that as well um, that, you know, might not have, like, a commercial output. <laughs> but, but also, you know, determining, you know, things like um, emotional state of, you know, AI that claims to detect, like, emotional state is really complicated because, what we're really talking about are like external patterns of behavior, um, which is not the same actually as your emotional state, right? The emotional right. state right. is complex and internal and culturally driven and all these things. So I'm always very skeptical about kind of, you know, emotional AI in terms of like being more precise about what we're capturing there. You know, it's not that like your AI is in fact empathetic. It is crunching, you know, data to predict 
how you are feeling. And that's different than it knowing that you feel a particular way. Does that make sense? Yes, that yeah. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like I'm going to, uh, Alexa, Siri, whoever you are out there, if you're listening. Right. Um, they are will, listening. Let me tell I you. I will take a bathroom <laughs> remodel to pilot the, <laughs> go ahead and turn the bubble bath water on Ooh. when I feel stressed uh -huh. study. And I'll buy uh -huh. the handle if, if someone else will pay for the bathtub. Um, I mean, is that is that a strategic funding request? I mean, like, can we make this happen? Um, yeah. Okay, if so, I want to put in one too, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so do you? Okay. Uh, this also may be a silly question. Uh, do you consider in your studies, or is it is it possible to consider like how how do the a and okay, so AI is not a real person, but right. yes. what, right. what, what if I, what if I am like, Siri, you sound stressed. <laughs> oh, I like, like that. It, cause it, cause you're talking about emotion, right? So what, yeah. what, at what point, or have you looked at the emotional ties, bonds with mm. your AI and is that ethical um when we talk yeah. I mean, when we're thinking about like privacy and data and it's like what are we getting ourselves into right i mean that's a that's not a short easy question at all that's a really good <laughs> question <laughs> but but i do like this concept but you're the part about like turning it the other way i mean so i don't um i don't personally study that the sort of attachment people have to technology but that is study um, and people, you know, I mean, this is sort of um, the effectiveness of anthropomorphizing technology is that we do, you know, connect with inanimate objects and mm -hmm. humanize them in different ways because, like, that's a skill set that we have. Like, you know, mm -hmm. we're social creatures. And mm -hmm. so, you know, Siri's talking to us and, and really trying to exploit that, right? Like, that's what that sort of design is meant to do. It's to sort of encourage us even more down that path of interacting mm -hmm. that way. Um, and so, yeah, people absolutely have, you know, form uh, kind of attached uh, relationships with their devices. They feel that they're personal, you know. Um, there's like a funny one about even like robot vacuums where um, people who send in their robot vacuums like for repair are like distressed when like a different one comes back. Like they are wanting to repair the one they own and love. And then like, if, if the manufacturer like is like, well, you know, we've sent you a different model. It's like, well, that's not my model. Like that's mm -hmm. not, you know, we call ours BB-8. That's not my BB-8, you know? <laughs> um, so yeah, people definitely form those connections and, um, you know, and, and programmers sort of have I think fun with this on the other end in terms of like, if you ask Siri questions about Siri, like you get answers, you know, like, uh -huh. it's, it's like kind of like Easter eggs, right? Like there's um, often responses that are programmed in. Um, so yeah, it kind of encourages us to think about these, but again, you know, you're, you're just dealing with, uh, it, it's not sentient. Like, don't worry, we're not there. <laughs> like, <laughs> yet? Yeah. Right, right, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. so first of all, I feel like I need to test all this stuff out <laughs> with <laughs> Siri and Alexa and see what happens, just, just for yeah, fun. Yeah, ask her questions, see how um, she's doing, you know, <laughs> check in on her, make sure she needs, like, what's the AI equivalent of a bubble bath? That's my right, question. Right, right. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is kind of a bigger picture question. And I can't yeah. wait to hear your answer on this. So one of the things that, you know, I think we all not struggle with, but kind of have to think about as scholars in our specific disciplines is how do we keep up with, with the area that you do research and the area that we, you know, all the research that we do in communication, um, if it's related to media, AI, it's changing. And it's changing, mm. I think, sometimes more quickly than we can even keep up with. So when you look at this area that you do research in, how how do you keep up? Because it seems like yeah. every week there's a new thing with AI or a new thing with voice assistants. And do you ever feel like you're always 
a little bit behind the eight ball because it's mm-hmm. just changing more rapidly. Does that make sense? It definitely does. I mean, absolutely. I, I often feel behind the eight ball. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, I think for me, I've had to kind of realize that you almost like can't keep up, but that's okay. Like, I like to stay, you know, generally informed, like a layperson, you know, um, maybe a more informed layperson on just things that are going on in the, in the field, right? Like, you know, chat GPT is mm-hmm. like the new kid on the block and um, I like to read about that and, you know, stay informed with the issues around that. Um, but, like, I don't have the time to, like, pivot my research agenda just because a new thing is out, right? Like, right. research is right. slower and steadier and deeper than that. And so I think that that's actually the comfort is that we need research to be thorough and take its time. And um, even though that sometimes feels that we're behind, it's it's really we're not because mm. there is a difference of like skipping around to different topics in a shallow way um, and sort of doing that deeper dive that um, can bring contributions and insights to new technologies, right, mm. via old, older technologies. So I experienced this with voice assistants for sure. Um, I've been working on these topics for a long time. A lot has changed in the field. And yet, at the same time, like, we still don't know everything, you know, like, there's a lot to ask questions about, even as it's changing. Um, so currently, I'm working on a book about voice assistants. And, Ooh. you know, books take, yes, it's very exciting. I have a, I got a contract. In last Yay! Fall for that. Congratulations! Yeah, thank you. So I'm working with Polity Press on that in their Digital Media and Society series. And, you know, it's like with books, like they take time, right? Like Mm -hmm. they take multiple years of um, of dialing in. And so that's scary because it seems Mm -hmm. like, okay, well, in that time frame, what if everything shifts, right? Mm -hmm. What if at the end of that, no one cares (laughs) about this topic anymore? Um, (laughs) But at the same time, it's like we need the documentation on the record for digital Mm -hmm. scholarship. You know, like we need Mm -hmm. people to do the deep dive so that it's there to, um, to, you know, to follow up on and to, um, you know, be that lasting record of scholarship that we build on in the future. So I would just, my advice, especially for like digital scholars who are in this environment where things are changing all the time, is just not to get like, you know, stay up in kind of a general way on things in the field, read, um, talk to people, you know, maybe like one way I stay fresh too is, you know, starting new collaborations with people who know different things than I know and, Mm. you know, learn learn more from those things, but, but also realize that like, you know, just like kind of in the journalism environment, like investigative journalism is slow and takes time and Mm -hmm. it's dogged. Mm -hmm. Research takes time and it's dogged. Mm -hmm. And, and like, you know, fast, like journalism isn't, you know, like doesn't displace the need for deep investigative journalism and, you know, kind of the same thing, right? Like we still need people to go and do deep dives in this work. Do you have a title? For your book? <laughs> I, well, the like placeholder is just like voice assistant. Um, and I was like, listen, I'm bad at thinking of titles, but a sexy title will emerge. I just like, you know, at the signing of the contract, didn't have it at me. And so my, my editor was like, well, we'll work on that. You know, we'll work on a sexy title. Um, so, so TBD, next time you follow up with me on this, maybe I'll have it figured out. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So, can you talk about? where this, where your research um, applies, and that's, that's not exactly a great question, but like, what, what fields should be like, ooh, I should take note of this? Yeah, for sure. Um, You just asked me, why does this matter? So what? Mm. I I heard it. That's the question. (laughs) Um, But it's an important question, right? I think Mm -hmm. that the kind of research I do um, and where I intend for it to impact is to, you know, be part of the record that could drive like policy, you know, and like kind Mm -hmm. of regulatory frameworks. Um, Mm -hmm. A lot of the interrogation that I do in my work is around this hugely imbalanced power landscape of the folks who get to design and set the tech agenda, which is really Mm -hmm. just kind of a handful of powerful companies and powerful executives. Um, And then the rest of us who live in this environment that is completely framed by the technologies that sometimes no one asked for, you know? Um, 
So, yeah, I mean, I, I really see this as a contribution to thinking about, you know, what kinds of privacy concerns do we have? What is what are the critiques around that power imbalance? What does it mean to to resist that or shift it? You know, what would be the role of policy in that? Um, yeah. I like it. Okay, oh, I so I, I, I've just made a note, Miriam, that we're going to have to get you back on the podcast and <laughs> keep talking about this. I'm and happy then, to. I love chatting with you all. <laughs> then you can give us more details on your sexy title for your book. Yeah, um, absolutely, absolutely. We are at the point in the podcast where we want to get some recommendations from you, and I'm betting we're going to get some great ones. Um, but these are just fun things, uh, Rex, for all of our listeners who may not have heard about a book, a movie, or a television show um so what is your favorite tv show or what are you watching right now okay sure so those are two different questions <laughs> i am like the longest stand possible for um amc's halt and catch fire which was a show that came out you know i don't know uh, five or six years ago maybe mm-hmm. um it is it documents though the uh, these programmers and the uh uh, 80s who are putting together, you know, computers and video games and Silicon Valley, early Silicon Valley in the 90s. Anyway, it um, it starts a little rough, like kind of Mad Mini, but then it, it takes you to a place, a space where women are really the center of the story. Um, mm-hmm. So I want to pitch that. It's like, I think one of the most underrated shows out there, but it kind of, you know, fits my tech interests uh, very much. So I'll, I'll say that's one of my favorites. Um, currently, I mean, I'm watching, you know, I stay on things. I'm watching The Last of Us on HBO and, <laughs> you know, trying to, like, um, keep up with whatever Pedro Pascal wants to do with his life. I'm, I'm there to watch it. It's fine. <laughs> um, but for tech recommendations, if you haven't watched Severance on, I think, Ooh, Apple TV, yeah, yeah. then that is kind of a, you know, sort of a sci-fi tech kind of one. And I thought that was very provocative and well done so that would be like my kind of sci-fi tech recommendation i say how how sci-fi is that because i watched that and i was like oh is is this is this happening right so what um what book are you reading now or tell us a book that we should all not miss okay sure i mean when i read for pleasure then i like to keep it like you know like kind of lighter and away from work so that i can Mm -hmm distinguish my work from <laughs> pleasure reading. Um, I really enjoyed recently, um, I'm kind of in a dark academia place. I really enjoyed Atlas Six by Olivia Blake. Um, it's a real nice kind of like uh, grown up sort of magical society situation. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of like, you know, sort of twists and turns around that. And it is a series, I think it's a trilogy. Um, I think two of the first two books are out. So yeah, I put that on my, my reading list. It was great fun to, to read. Okay. So keeping in lines with Rex, what about a movie? Do you have a, um, favorite movie or one that you would definitely recommend we not miss? (laughs) Well, let me just like reach back. Okay. So if we're talking about favorites and I'm going to keep it kind of like tech oriented here, Mm -hmm. Uh, like I'm obsessed with Sneakers, the movie that came out in like the 90s with like Robert Redford and like a whole bunch of other people. And it's like heist vibes. Um, oh. it's like, you know, they're like, we're using computers, you know, us <laughs> because it's the early 90s. And it's amazing. I don't know. Um, it, it holds the test of time. If I, if people are like, what should you watch? I'm like, how about sneakers? You know, and my husband is <laughs> like, great. oh my God, how many times are we going to watch this? You know, that's awesome. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Last question is if your life was or mm-hmm. if you wanted to be on a reality oh. show, oh my god. Which one would that be? <laughs> okay. I, I totally know the answer to this. The okay. circle on Netflix where you like try to catfish each other. Um <gasps> but, yeah, like <laughs> I've watched too much of it, and I'm like, put me in, coach. I'm ready. You know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's incredible. Now I have to watch The Circle on Netflix. Right. <laughs> Um, Miriam, it has been so wonderful catching up with you and having this conversation and learning more about all that you've been doing since we last spoke to you two years ago. 
thank you so much for making the time in your day to, to check in with us. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a real pleasure and I'm happy to uh, talk when, whenever, whenever you would have me back. So thank you so much. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Thanks, All right. Miriam. Thank you.